Okay, uh, so uh, Kaya, Wanju, everybody here from, uh, we're here in Perth on, on Nungar Lands. Um, and today we're going to give you what we're calling, a, I suppose, a, a pracademic history of uh, Salvado and the Northwest Corridor uh, here in Perth. And it's interesting in light of the three previous uh, presentations, so that uh, from our perspective, we're in a peripheral centrality uh, that is Perth within the Australian context. Uh, so it's been interesting following the presentations from our east as we look eastwards from LA to Sydney to Adelaide and now here to Perth. So I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Neil, who's the um, uh, an esteemed planning professional here in Western Australia and a planning historian. And he's going to kind of lead uh, the presentation and I'll cut in every now and again on things. Um, so, what is or what was Salvado? Um, the report that I show here is uh, something that I was asked to get a copy of in my um, first year of studying planning here in Perth in about 1974. Um, and uh, it talks about Salvado in men. Um, it came, this report that many of you in Australia will know is the Cities Commission report of 1973, which is uh, when Labor government in, uh, in in Canberra, in the federal parliament, federal government in Australia came to power in, and uh, started throwing money uh, at urban and regional development. Um, and the ideas in vogue at the time were all the things that have been talked about earlier today decentralisation, uh, new towns, satellite towns, etc. Um, but uh, when I, I, first, I first got my, my first holiday job at the a place called the Shire of Wanneroo, which features in this area that was named Salvado in 1975-76 uh, over the summer holiday period. And by that time, Salvado, uh, the city of Wanneroo is in the northwest corridor, and Salvado, which it was renamed to, had been totally forgotten. And then I got my first permanent job there at the uh, Shire of Wanneroo in 1977, and uh, it was never mentioned again. So it, the name disappeared, but I always noticed that People, um, historian, plenty historians from the eastern states in particular always talk about Salvado. So I was there, involved in it, studied here, worked here, and uh, so I thought it was would be interesting to have a look at uh, what did happen to Salvado, and that's where this comes from. And Paul and I have looked at um, many, many files and have thousands of images of uh, pages from the State Records Office of Western Australia. So... Uh, in this report from uh, the federal government, basically, we see the uh, the emergence of uh, the federal government basically breaking into the area of urban planning, which they hadn't really been involved in before. And this is, we see this through the, the setting up of the Federal Department of Urban and Regional Development, uh, and then subsequently into the Cities Commission, where the whole idea of uh, suppose growth centres uh, was really kind of concentrated within. And this is at a time when, I suppose, the urban, suburban environment in metropolitan, uh, Australian, metropolitan Australia was under con considerable stress. So we had the kind of this urban problem and concerns with, you know, excessive population concentrations. And as with all planning, obviously, an eye to the future. And we see here that obviously the year 2000, the new millennium uh, was kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, a benchmark for uh, where we might be going to and what we should, what we should, uh, the form of city should be like by that period. Um, and essentially, there are two basic growth center typologies outlined in this report. So one is a kind of metropolitan growth center, and then there's a regional growth center, which which uh, Rob picked up on in his presentation. So we have this kind of, I suppose, uh, well, we we were kind of calling, uh, I suppose internalized decentralization or small d decentralization in the sense that uh, decentralization was still taking place within the metropolitan systems and then big d decentralization whereby new towns would be set up proper in outside the you know the the orbit of uh, of metropolitan uh, regions basically here in uh, australia and so we have the example here outlined in this report of albury with Ladonga as a particular example and 
it's a fairly, you know, I suppose the 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 approach and philosophy outlined by the federal government uh, and various uh, kind of key actors involved here. So Tom Uran, who many Australians will be familiar with, but also uh, the late Patrick Troy uh, kind of has his fingerprints in here as well. And there's a very kind of rational, comprehensive approach to uh, this whole idea of having new kind of growth centres uh, around, uh, you know, the different states and territories in Australia. And there, there's, I suppose, the, the rational thinking is kind of trying to be mindful of the whole gamut of things that will be necessary in terms of develop, planning and developing a new town. So there's the spatial, the economic, the physical, uh, the environmental, uh, all of those things, basically. And, and then ultimately, I think at the bottom is, uh, you know, this idea of kind of political consensus. And again, I think that speaks to some of the comments raised in previous, uh, uh, in Christine's uh, presentation about whether or not we can actually realise political consensus in realising these visions. So, so for um, Western Australia in that Cities uh, Commission program, they, they identified um, five areas where they might be willing to um, put money into it. Because remember, the, well, for those who don't know who are not from Australia, um, constitutionally, the federal government really doesn't control planning. It's the states that control the actual planning, statutory planning, decision-making processes. But the federal government has um, leverage by funds for maybe acquiring land for projects or for doing projects or for doing studies. So that's where the federal government uh, was very keen to get involved back here. So they looked at five areas. One there was the Perth Northwest Corridor. I'll explain a little bit about that later. Uh, one was up at Pil Pilbara, which was where about 2,000 kilometres north of Perth, where mining was of, was happening, particularly of iron ore. Um, and there was it was a big resource um, boom in the late 60s, and uh, there was a keen desire by both sides of politics to actually value add and start making things like steel or refining alumina. Um, and um, so, um, but there are three other regional centres they looked at, which was Geraldton, Bunbury, and Albany. Now, at the time, Perth had about seven, Metropolitan Perth had about 700, um, yeah, 700,000 people in the metropolitan area. But the next biggest cities are in the order of, you know, 20 to 30,000 people, Bunbury, Albany, and Geraldton. And that's all in 2.5 square, 2.5 million square kilometres. So it was, um, the other projects they're looking at. So, and this is a page from the uh, 1973 report. Um, so as soon as the federal government got into power on the 5th of December 1972, they were off talking to the states straight away. And because Western Australia was a Labor state, they were already, they seemed to already be ready to, to go. And so WA put forward this Northwest Corridor, which they later named Salvado, um, as one of the, um, the projects that they would like funding for, to buy land, to do studies, etc. Um, but just going back to um, the way planning works in Perth, for those particularly not from Australia, because many over east will already understand this, but Perth has, has had since 1955 a series of strategic regional plans done for it, um, which are non-statutory. Um, they always look 30 to 40, 50 years ahead. They get, they get adopted as a guide or policy by the Planning Commission, WAPC, Western Australian Planning Commission, and the state government, usually at cabinet level, um, but they need mechanisms to make them happen. And so in Western Australia, we have a system for re metropolitan or for regions called uh, region planning schemes, which are statutory legal plans. So we've had four of these plans, 1955, 1970, 1990, and 2010. Um, Stevenson Hepburn plan, um, it, 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 was done when Perth, Metropolitan Perth had 400,000 people. There were um, statutory, um, there were, they were planning for about 1.4 million people in those brown areas showing on the plan. Um, and for only two major centres, Perth and Fremantle, and 30 much smaller district centres. There was no Northwest Corridor, um, which is this area up here. Uh, so they were going to limit, limit the uh, extent of Perth at the time. I thought they could get the 1.4 million people in there. Um, and, but what they recommended was a special tax to buy land for public purposes. So any regional parks for, for major regional roads or other regional infrastructure. And they said, let's have, we need a planning authority, um, independent, independent planning authority that would, uh, that would make decisions, statutory decisions and 
non-statute, non-legal decisions, create policies and plans. Um, that resulted in, uh, that plan got converted and 55 plans got converted into this plan, which was a regional statutory plan. Uh, it had weight, the local councils, the 30 odd local councils in the metropolitan area, local governments, they had to, their plan, their local planning schemes, because they could already prepare local planning schemes, had to fit within that overall plan. And any land on here that was shown as a regional reserve, such as the dark green areas, which are regional parks or the red lines, which are major roads, if it was privately owned land, then the planning commission got money each year from a special tax to be able to buy the land. So that's kind of the system as it had evolved to. Oops, so I go too far there. Let me go there. Um, yeah. um, so, but, but as I said, the, the brown areas on that plan got filled up pretty quickly. Uh, and the 1.4 million people that were shown in the Stevenson Hepburn plan, um, uh, basically the footprint covered double that area by the time it was reached in around about 2000. Um, so the question was, how do we, how, what, what policy do we have to uh, amend that plan, region planning scheme, metropolitan region planning scheme? So in 1970, the, um, the MRPA, which was the Planning Commission today, uh, came out with this middle document called the Corridor Plan to Perth. And they looked at different examples. They looked at the Copenhagen Finger Plan, Washington, and other places all around the world, and came up with a plan that was basically saying, let's grow Perth in corridor in a corridor fashion. But they had all these other studies that went on from 1966, from its conception, to 1973, when state government finally um, agreed to uh, adopt it. But there was a huge amount of public debate. So the 1970 Corridor Plan uh, essentially... Um, said uh, we'll grow Perth in corridors, we'll have the, these spaces in between, will be non-urban areas for multi-purposes such as conservation, water, um, agriculture and all those other regions. Recent, uh, we'll have um, corridors of growth where in each corridor we'll have a sub, sub-regional centre and Perth will try to limit the growth of Perth in terms of its employment and we'll concentrate employment in these outer areas. In terms of the Northwest Corridor, this area up here, um, the idea was to have it create a brand new city on some government land at Lake Joondalup and, um, and then have high quality transport running through the middle of it to with brakes in it to get back to Perth. So that's the general principles. Um, now, background to um, Salvado. So, um, as I said, there's, WA was resource rich. There was lots of mining going on in the late 60s. There was nickel, iron ore, many other minerals. Um, agriculture was taken. It was as important as agriculture was to the economy. And Western Australia had a practice of, um, for these big resource projects in particular, of having agreement acts. So the, the state government would enter into an agreement with a, a, um, a company and then they would enact it as an act of parliament. So it had legal. And these things usually said the state government will give you this bit of land and we'll give you all these tax incentives, we'll give you all these different sorts of things. So BHP, Australia's biggest um, resource company, I suppose. Um, in 1960 and 64, had two acts relating to steelworks and other things. Um, there's a commitment in there, in that act, that they would expand steel production by 500,000 tonnes per year uh, by 1978. They, they created a um, some steelworks at, uh, at, at Quinana, which is just uh, south of Perth. Some of you have heard of that. Um, but by 1971, the Director of Industrial Development and Decentralisation want, wanted the steel interest in, um, industry to be decentralised well away from Perth. Uh, Quinana, which was in the metropolitan region, and another area south of that called Kennedy, uh, was opposed by the Town Planning Commission. This was, this was in an era when the um, heads of these government departments really ran things compared to today. The, the ministers um, had a lot more influence over ministers, and they were, um, and so. When the Town Planning Commission proposed it, it didn't really get very far. So I think we, and this is a work in progress, as we've said, there's uh, lots more files to be consulted. So this is a skeleton outline of what happened with this. But in, I think sometime in 1972, the Director of Industrial Development and Decentralisation did some, had some prelim, preliminary investigations done that indicated an area north of that northwest corridor in the, in the corridor plan that I showed you, outside of the metro region, uh, a place called uh, Wilbinga, or just south of the Moore River, probably about um, 60 kilometres, 60, 70 kilometres north of Perth, was a possible location for a port because you couldn't have steel making or other major industries unless you had a decent port. And there weren't that many spots along the coast that you could have a decent port. So 
Um, on the, so as soon as the Whitlam Federal Labor Government took office on the 5th of December 1972, within three weeks, the, the Prime Minister, Whitlam, had written to the WA Labor Premier uh, seeking cooperation on land matters, and here's some letters here. Um, by the, on the, if you look, at, look here, on the Premier, John Tonkin, of Western Australia, on the 4th of January 1973, so only um, six days after and over the Christmas New Year period, um, had, had written a cabinet submission, um, which was part, which went through on the uh, 9th of January. That cabinet agreed that we, we need to work with the federal government over this. So this was all must work must have been going on before in the backgrounds because in um, in anticipation that the federal Labor government might get in. Um, so on 16 January 1973, the WA Labor cabinet cabinet approved. Um, a new suburban metropolitan centre north of Perth. So this is the beginning of Savada. This is the first time it kind of gets mentioned. Now, talking about 32,000 hectares of land in that northwest corridor, um, but this had a bit of an add-on because of you, um, because the northwest corridor actually finished there because it was supposed to be a metropolitan corridor, corridor and the metropolitan region finished about there. And they had done some work to identify that this was the location for a port and for steel industry um, but the um, part of the um, project was to for the government the state government to purchase all the industrial and power station sites all the region owned space and 15 percent of all the residential land for low-cost housing and this is a controversial bit the let they also had three bits of some legislation they were going to propose that would freeze land acquisition prices for all this as of 1st of January 1973. So this is the kind of federal labour, um, state labour, um, working together on these sorts of things, which the Liberal government, Liberal, Liberal governments in Australia are conservative for those overseas. Um, to, and so they defined, and the other controversial thing was they were going to excise um, land from the local government control, which is essentially much of this, the Shire of Wanneroo, and it would have also included the Shire of Jinjin, which is a council area just to the north of the metro region. And they were going to create a new town development corporation. Uh, so they issued a press statement on 18th of January 1973. So um, this is all going very, very quickly. And you know, I spent 30 odd years in state government in WA, and uh, this is extremely quickly. Um, so on the 23rd of January, um, Cabinet prepared the preparation of a development study to try and flesh out what this Northwest Corridor might look like with the add on of this. Um, uh, this port and major industrial area north of the uh, metropolitan region, just at um, Wilbinga. And they only had two months to do it. It had to be completed by the 31st of March. They also thought, well, what are we going to call this place? So they sent, um, they, they requested the nomenclature committee of the lands department, which decided all place names, what to do. And they also authorised the drafting of some bills to, to um, make it all happen in terms of uh, development, corporation and uh, fixing land prices and things like that. So on 5th of May, a few months later, Cabinet approved the drafting of three land bills, uh, which we're going to um, list, and you can't read that sister. But over here on the right-hand side, it says, it summarises what the, um, the bills were going to do. So they would um, give the government power to um, acquire land at, uh, at a certain price, nominated price for certain areas, a nominated di date, They'd uh, excise the 80,000 acres or 32,000 hectares of the coastal strip and have a development commission, and they'd also set up land commissions, um, which I think this part of it morphed into something called later on called the um, Urban Land Council in Western Australia. I think most states had those. Um, so from the files, we've managed to... There are so many clippings, which is very useful, to uh, give us a, a feel of what, what the reaction was. Um, Wanneroo, on the right here, uh, they weren't very happy at all. They were disgusted, in fact, um, as soon as the government put out their idea about the three bills. Um, um, but those, the Monster reports that I mentioned, the, uh, the federal government funding did result in the preparation of um, the Northwest Corridor report. It wasn't called Salvado by then because this was March and they hadn't decided on the Salvado name by then. Um, and then one for the actual June Lup Centre. So, so instead of being a single centre corridor, which is going to be June Love City Centre with major, uh, mainly, um, let's call it high level service employment with um, university and 
teaching hospital and all those courthouses and all those sort of things. They were going to have that second centre or node, as was the terminology back then, but, um, uh, for heavy industry and port further north. Um, so within two months, this is what the uh, Monsters consultants had come up with of how you might flesh out um, the uh, the corridor. They had one with this uh, with a um, if you had a if you built a ten million ton per annum steel plant uh, with next to the port, then um, you'd get, obviously get a lot more people up there. If you had more of a conventional steelworks, then you would have less. It was bought from about 1973 onwards. The state government, the Labor and the and later on the Liberal government, the Conservative one, they were really pushing for this added value to create a steelwork somewhere in Western Australia, a jumbo one. They wanted a huge one. Um, so, and this is just the plan that was prepared for the Junior Lab Centre um, for this more service, called service employment. Um, so, to put this one in, this one in just, it was just interesting. Why did they pick the name Salvado? Well, it was actually named after a Spanish monk who came to Western Australia in 1846 um, and had uh, created uh, missions at uh, New Subiaco and at New Norcia out of Perth. And, and the name was actually came up with by the nomenclature committee and they'd had a vote on it. You can see on the right hand side there that they, they did tallies of who first preference, second preference. And so that's how we got the name anyway. And if you were wondering, because it's not documented anywhere, we really um, we struggled to find that. I was scratching my head. I knew that it would have been named after him, but how it happened, we didn't know. So more press clippings and a race on to win money, because all about getting the money. As I said, federal government in Australia, really the main, their main role in urban and regional development is money. Um, they do have some other controls uh, in other areas, some environmental controls and other things, but that's it. Um, it talks to here about nuclear power, powered plants as well. You know, that was the year when we were, we were talking about them. Um, and Alan Bond, a nice young um, a developer, owned much of the Northwest Corridor. He owned uh, about 7,000 hectares of it at the time, Yanship Sun City. Um, you like this one on the left, don't you? <laughs> so, so what we see there, I mean, just quickly, so Alan Bond obviously had lots of vested interests and he was opposed to the government's intervention of taking land prices, which was in one of the bills. And we kind of see this resistance basically emerging uh, from a number of different quarters and different actors throughout um, uh, throughout Perth and Western Australia. So I, think I really like this clipping here, which talks about coastrophobia and the idea basically that this, act, this character uh, uh, Webb was promoting was is that this whole 80,000 uh, hectares, acres basically, was going to be completely industrialized so there, there was going to be this massive industrialization in, in Perth and there were all sorts of other kind of uh, comments coming from political quarters so Sir Charles Court later Premier of Liberal Premier of Western Australia saw the bills as a form of socialism uh, the Bond Corporation obviously private sector interests and then this handwritten letter from a resident in the leafy western suburbs here complaining about uh, well, on the one hand, congratulating the Premier for the new city, but on the, but with the backhand, uh, slagging him off for calling the city Salvado because it was alien and foreign, basically. So it kind of gives you an idea of the kind of the xenophobia around the place. So you've got lots of opposition basically going through here. Uh, we even have the late Professor uh, Martin Webb uh, slamming the bill, basically a geographer, uh, slamming things, making it in the press, the libs fighting it. And there's just so much stuff basically going on. Ultimately, the state government drops the three bills. It doesn't have the numbers in parliament, particularly in the upper house of the legislative council here in, in WA. So very mindful of time. So we'll just kind of run through this. So court kind of, um, you know, uh, outlines his kind of position on things in response to a letter uh, from somebody who had studied planning at RMIT of all places. But ultimately there was still support. The Libs actually were in support of, of a kind of uh, steelworks, despite their kind of political rhetoric coming from particularly uh, Sir Charles Court. Uh, so we see foreign investments, uh, interest kind of flowing into uh, this Northwest Corridor. Uh, from the US and Japan in particular, and a number of uh, developers and speculators here, basically, in, in Perth. 
And there are plans drawing up actually for uh, for this jumbo uh, steel plant in the northwest. Very detailed plans from BHP. They've spent about a million dollars, and they look at the three sites: one at Banana and Metro Perth, and then others. Um, and, but, it, uh, but it fell apart after a while. The US company pulled out, citing labour skills. They weren't sure if they'd get in, but particularly labour costs. Why not build in America? Labour costs are about the same. And they're all worried about environmental controls. The Japanese pulled out for similar reasons. There's also a steel making recession. And then there are other plants in countries like Philippines being proposed with much lo- lower labour costs. So the last letter on the fire, one of the last letters, is a 1979 letter from BHP to the Premier of WA saying, well, you know, it's probably not going to happen. It's very, very politely worded. So um, then we got to the planning structure of the Northwest Corridor. Um, when it came out the, uh, in 1977, it didn't show anything in Mulbinga. That was the boundary of the metro region. Um, it, but it did leave the options. It had a plan in it showing the options for these um, steel, made, steel works major industry in a port in the Northwest Corridor. Um, a plan was prepared for June and June and there was a bit of legislation to make it happen, but it was on government land. It wasn't um, you know, take, taking private land. Um, in 1987, the corridor plan of the government decided to review it, so the planning commission did that. Um, but interestingly, they showed a green belt at Yulbinga because the WA government bought some of the land on the coast and they owned some of the land as state forest. Um, they decided to, to cut off the northwest corridor and the Anship Two Rocks area, which was used to be Alan Bond's land. Uh, that was not uh, shown. Um, and, uh, but then when the final plan, after advertising came out, it went back in and we had uh, the Northwest Corridor and the Antship Land was in there. Um, but um, when the next version of that 1977 plan, the Northwest Corridor Structure Plan came out, they didn't resolve these issues in the Antship Two Rocks area. And, um, but in 1973, finally after this issue went to Cabinet, all the land that was purchased for this uh, this port, um, this was the end of it because the cabinet decided in 1992 to put it to conservation as part of a regional park. So, very quickly, so all we end up basically with is, is half a peripheral centrality in the sense that uh, Joondalup City, which was, which has been called Perth Second City, is developed, but it's uh, it's very much a kind of a suburban peripheral centrality in the sense that. It's dominated by kind of suburban residential development. It does have a town centre, uh, which is there in the yellow, but it's dominated by this suburban shopping centre, which completely divorces it basically in terms of the scale. So we've got two interesting uh, peripheral centralities going on up here, basically. Um, I'm mindful of time, so I think, and then this is our last slide. So, so well, in 1996, Cabinet, it's an absolute final nail in the coffin because Cabinet of Government said that we're going to create a Nangara park, a regional park around much of the north part of Perth, and Wilbinga, where the port was going to be, was included in it. So that was finally the end of it in 1996. And that's it. And sorry, sorry, Nick. That's okay, guys. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think your your talk could have been as sprawling and as extensive as the corridor itself yeah given all the material that you've managed to uh, to get hold of um but um yeah uh, obviously speaks to a lot of the themes that we're interested in there and and uh, a good point to end on um i've got as usual i've got a comment um but um uh i'll throw it open to to others of course before me um to to make observations or ask questions or or, or make their own uh, comments so um Please, anyone raise a virtual hand or a, or a real hand if you'd like to uh, get something to Paul and Neil. Can I just take your comment, Nick? Or maybe uh, there's Julie. Oh, Julie's, Julie's just put her hand up there, I think. So, Julie. Okay. Um, sorry, I... I... Would you would you please give a bit more like clear indication why exactly this planning scheme actually failed? Why this um, new town or, or corridor actually didn't yet? Because your title seems indicating it's a failure, but I didn't quite catch the reason why it's, why its current state you know didn't get realized. Is it a total failure or is it? Um... Yeah, what's going on? 
the, the way I look at it, um, the Northwest Corridor was going to be a corridor with transport um, based around one centre, being Joondala, which was going to be a service centre for the Northwest Corridor for all the residents that lived there. But what was added on in Salvado was this idea of another node, an employment node, but a different type of one, an industrial court facility, major, major one, to the north of that area that was never really contemplated in the 1970 corridor plan. But in addition, there were those three bills, which were create a development corporation, take away land, buy land at uh, you know, fixed prices and things like that, which uh, were the other components of what the concept for Salvado was. But they didn't happen, so we basically ended up with the Northwest Corridor Structure Plan as per, or struck a corridor as per the 1970 Corridor Plan. My, my kind of gut thesis on this, and we'll, we need to go back in and look at the, at the archives a bit more, is there, there would seem to be some kind of political manoeuvring going on to set up a, the plant or the port and the steel plant to the north, because Quinana in the south, which is effectively a new town, new industrial town, um, BHP's preference would have been to try, to try to expand there or else they wanted to go even further north, all the way up to Port Hedland uh, in the north, in the very northwest of the state, basically. And it's, it seems clear from some of the, from the pushback from the Shire of Wanneroo and a, and a number of other councils within the metropolitan region, but also councils, regional councils or rural councils in WA, that they didn't see uh, the state government's decentralization policy as real decentralization policy. So the port's just outside the orbit of the metropolitan region. So it's kind of in the regions because it's in it's effectively in Jinjin, but it's not a, it's not real decentralization. So there's there's something a little bit of clever political rhetoric and kind of maneuvering going on is is my kind of thesis on things. Okay, great. Uh, other comments, questions before I um, get mine out there? Okay. Uh, was that, were you scratching your head there, Roger, or was, it, uh, was that a question? <laughs> um, so mine is, I mean, I was just looking at one of the images on, you know, um, on the, um, the documents you had there, very sort of rectilinear kind of, image of this corridor and, and it and it struck me as very similar to stuff that was being produced in an area that i'm familiar with south hampshire the same sort of map um and rob robert freestone talked about the power of visuals and you just wonder whether by about the 1970s you know particularly in the global north that this was the sort of high point of a number of different things coming together um possibly poor poor choices about visuals if, if you're going to persuade people that this corridor is a, is a great idea, the sheer scale of what is being planned here is not something that fits all that well with the general populace or even local government areas. It's a, you know, the things that, are, that, that people get excited about or engage with at planning scale, uh, planning is, is at the very local scale typically. When you get planning at this scale, it, it really fails to capture the, the sort of public imagination. And then you, then you, I wonder whether you've even got the sort of charismatic figures that you might have had with, say, what Christian was talking about. It, it's a, it's a bureaucracy, relatively faceless. Um, who's, who's promoting it? Is, is there much charisma behind it? You get a whole confluence of things behind this, and I just wonder whether it was, you know, the real high watermark of of um, modernist planning that that kind of, oh, you know enough of this, you know, uh, and you know, quite significant direction of resources, you know, um, you know, why don't you locate your steel plant here? Um, and to a certain extent, some of those large corporations were in, in on this, you know, corporatist kind of big picture planning. But I don't know, you know, whether that any of those ingredients are part of the, the reason why it didn't capture the imagination. Uh, I mean, at the kind of macro political level, there was certainly uh, big charismatic personalities, you know, so uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Gough Whitlam and Tom Uran, who headed up the Department of uh, Urban Regional Development. Um, and, you know, there was just this timely alignment between a, a Labour federal government and a Labour state government here in WA. And 
it's you know, I suppose it's a it's a period then of kind of that you know big government intervention, and the federal government had a you know I think a, a you know it, it has a social justice kind of agenda in mind when you when you read through that city commission's report, for example, because they talk about equity an awful lot. They talk about spatial equity. They talk about housing equity. The idea to peg land prices in order to build affordable housing uh, is there, but it's counterposed by these other big personalities, uh, you know, Alan Bond in particular, who many Australians will be, you know, familiar with. Um, you know, he was a, you know, rafish, roguish kind of individual, you know, ultimately, you know, and ended up in prison and stuff. So, so there was a lot of that there. That, and that mod- it is, I think it is a high point of kind of modernist uh, planning, Nick, you know, I think... Because there's a lot of analysis sitting behind all of this, basically, as well as that, so, like I said, that social justice agenda. It's all the more interesting why, in some ways, it you know it it it, it didn't work in its in 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 its full realization, if you like, and, and not just here, but 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 elsewhere. Um, you know, because some of those issues are still unresolved, or or at least um, you know probably for, uh, prefigured some of the things that still need to be resolved, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, look, I, I think, I mean, you probably have here, I mean, so it's 1973, essentially, around about that, that period. So Richard Court, who's in the in the Liberal Party at the time, who then becomes Premier later. So just to repeat what Nathan says, the Liberal Party here is the Conservatives. They're not, so for those who are in North America, we don't, they're not Liberals. So this is kind of proto-neoliberalism basically going on, I think, in some senses, with the opposition, you know, uh, court describing land pegging as socialism, uh, you know, and the utterances that he made in Parliament and in the media and stuff like this, basically. So the, there's other big um, agendas kind of going on here in a way, and sort of political uh, performativity and ideological per- performativity basically going on as well. 